Hi, it's Jen and welcome to my channel and in this video I'm going to be talking about how brain imaging can be used to potentially predict effective treatments for depression. This topic is actually really important to me because when I was a senior in high school I lost my father to suicide and I became very depressed and I was really wondering are some people not meant to be happy in this world? Is it impossible for some people to be happy? And it was at that time where I began to use neuroscience as a tool for self-empowerment. And what I mean by that is I was using neuroscience as a way to just learn more about the brain and learn about what does a happy brain look like? What does a depressed brain look like? And trying to understand the difference. And as I was learning the difference between what a happy brain looks like and what a depressed brain looks like, I became frustrated because I realized that the psychiatric industry and does not use neuroscience to predict what meds to give to people. They just give you certain meds and it's a guess and check system. And this made no sense to me. With any other disease, we usually know what's going on inside of the body and why we are giving a certain medication to work with those symptoms. But in this case, it's just guess and check. And with depression especially, there are so many different types of depression and different ways depression shows up in the brain. So that's why it makes no sense that people are just given the same drugs, try them out. If they work, you stay on the drugs. And if they don't work, you change up the drugs. It makes no sense to start everybody out with the same drugs when most people have different forms of depression from each other. It's extremely frustrating because most of these drugs have negative side effects, including worsening depression and suicide. And it makes me wonder if the antidepressant my father was taking when he committed suicide added to the suicide rather than preventing it. The diagnosis of depression is very broad and I'm going to read to you what it is right now so you can understand how broad depression is itself is. A diagnosis of major depressive disorder um, or MDD requires a persistent disturbance of mood, which is sadness or in children irritability, or a loss of interest or pleasure in virtually all activities, in addition to at least four of the following symptoms, which include sleep disturbance, guilt, loss of energy, impaired concentration, change in appetite, psychomotor agitation, or retardation, and suicidal ideation. So the study we'll be looking at today is called Resting State Connectivity Biomarkers Define Neurophysiological Subtypes of Depression. So as I said earlier, there are many different brain chemistries that can cause depression. And this study identified four different biotypes by using fMRI data um, to distinguish between depression. Now, the study noted that they could have broken it up into even more specific biotypes, but to keep this study simple, they stuck to four, but they did find that each of these four groups was different from each other, uh, enough to the, uh, the point to make them separate groups. It's obvious already that if you can take a group of people that have been diagnosed with depression and break them up into four different biotypes that respond differently to treatment, then it doesn't make sense to be treating everyone with this diagnosis with the same treatments. It should be based on what your connectivity looks like or just things that are more specific than just the clinical diagnosis of depression. The treatment that was tested on these four different groups of depression was called transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy. So in general, depression is caused by dysfunctional connectivity between the limbic network and the frontostriatal network. And since this study found four different biotypes of depression, they found that there was different connectivity between the limbic networks and the frontostriatal networks between these four biotypes. So the limbic network is related to emotions, memory, and arousal. The frontal striatal circuits are neural pathways that connect frontal lobe regions with basal ganglia, which are areas of the brain that mediate motor, cognitive, and behavioral functions within the brain. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS for short, is a non-invasive procedure that uses magnetic fields to stimulate nerve cells in the brain to improve symptoms of depression. TMS is typically used when other depression treatments have not been effective. There were three main dysfunctions in connectivity that made each biotype distinct from each other. And some biotypes share dysfunctions and some have unique dysfunctions. So the dysfunctions included reduced connectivity in the frontal amygdala networks, which were correlated with increased anxiety, reduced connectivity in the anterior cingulate and orbitofrontal areas were corresponded to abnormal lack of energy, and hyperconnectivity in the thalamic and frontostriatal networks were related to increased anhedonia, which is an inability to feel pleasure, and hyperconnectivity in the thalamic and frontostriatal networks 
We're also related to psychomotor retardation, which involves slowing down of thought and a reduction in physical movements in an individual. So biotype 1 had reduced connectivity in the frontal amygdala networks, and biotype 1 also had reduced connectivity in the anterior cingulate and orbitofrontal areas. Thus, biotype 1 was associated with symptoms of increased anxiety and abnormal lack of energy. Biotype 2 only had reduced connectivity in the anterior cingulate and orbitofrontal areas, thus they were only associated with symptoms of abnormal lack of energy. Biotype 3 had hyperconnectivity in the thalamic and frontostriatal areas, thus they were associated with symptoms of anhedonia and psychomotor retardation. Biotype 4 had reduced connectivity in the frontoamygdala networks, as well as hyperconnectivity in thalamic and frontostriatal networks, thus they were associated with symptoms of increased anxiety and increased hedonia and psychomotor retardation. Here I'll show an image of a picture I've drawn which shows kind of the overlap of these different biotypes. So this picture shows the distribution of the dysfunctional connectivity for each of the biotypes. So as you can see, biotype 1 is blue, 2 is red, 3 is pink, and 4 is gray. And I just wanted to show you this image so you could kind of get an idea showing that there's different functional connectivity in different areas for these biotypes. Some of them are in similar locations and some of them aren't. The size of each of these representations shows how dysfunctional the connectivity is in these areas. And this scatter plot shows that with anhedonia on the x-axis and anxiety on the y-axis, you can see how the different biotypes differ um, between the symptoms of anhedonia and anxiety. Some have low anxiety but higher anhedonia. Um, and it's interesting because out of the four groups, uh, cluster two is actually related to the least amount of depression and there's the lowest amount of anhedonia and the lowest amount of anxiety in cluster two. So this graph shows how each of the four biotypes differ in some of the different symptoms of depression. So for example, when you look at um, anhedonia, uh, group biotype three and four have more anhedonia, whereas groups one and two have less anhedonia. When we look at ener energia and fatigue, biotypes one and two are higher in it and three and four are lower in it. This graph shows that biotypes one, three, and four all have depression at about an equal amount, whereas biotype two um, out of the four groups has the lowest severity of depression. It's important to note that clustering a group based on fMRI data is actually more effective and consistent than just creating a group based on clinical symptoms. These studies show that the longitudinal stability of subtype diagnosis based on clinical symptoms in the blue or the resting state functional connectivity features in the red for 50 subjects that were assessed on two occasions, which were four to five weeks apart. Diagnoses based on clinical information alone were longitudinally unstable. By contrast, subtype diagnoses based on resting state functional connectivity features were relatively stable. So let's look at the boxes all the way on the right. This shows that at from four weeks from the first time that they diagnose people either based off of clinical symptoms or resting state functional connectivity. When we only diagnose based off of clinical symptoms, people who were, who, who were put into clinical group one were diagnosed in clinical group one at a rate of 7.1%, two at 42.9%, group three were put in the same group only 37.5% of the time, and group four were put in the same group 81.2% of the time. Whereas when the groups were broken up based on resting state functional connectivity, they were put in the same group 87.5% of the time for group one, 92.2% of the time for group two, 93.3% for group three, and 85.7% for group four. So using fMRI data is much more consistent and stable long-term than by just doing it based off of clinical symptoms. Even though the fMRI data is associated with some clinical symptoms such as anxiety or abnormal lack of energy, it is important to note that these groups were made by using the resting state functional connectivity and not just the clinical symptoms that these people were stating that they had. This graph shows that over 80% of the people in biotype 1 affected 
positively to the TMS treatment, whereas about 60% responded positively in Biotype 3 and less than 30% um, in Biotypes 2 and 4 responded positively to TMS. So this goes to show that not all people who are diagnosed with depression should just have treatments thrown at them. So now in the future, if people go in and get fMRI tests to look at their depression and they are found to be in biotype 1, then it would be a good recommendation for them to get TMS. But if they're in bio group 2 or 4, it might not be as good of an idea to do TMS. Which again, TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Again, this is a box plot that shows the effectiveness of TMS on the different biotypes. Now, as we see, each of the biotypes still responded differently even within themselves on how they reacted to TMS. So the researchers did further investigation to see what functional connectivity areas in the brain were related to uh, the reaction to TMS. So some of the areas that were associated with the effectiveness of TMS include the connectivity between the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and the left amygdala, left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, bilateral orbitofrontal cortex, and the posterior cingulate cortex. Connectivity between other areas that were not directly stimulated by the RTMS protocol but were related to the effectiveness of TMS included the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, thalamus, nucleus accumbens, and globus pallidus. And when they lo just looked at these connectivity features I just mentioned. Non-responders were classified as non-responders 77% of the time correctly. Responders were grouped as accurate responders 78.7% of the time. But when the connectivity features were paired with subtype diagnosis, non-responders were labeled as non-responders correctly 86.8% of the time and responders were labeled responders correctly 93.6% of the time. When we just looked at clinical features alone and not using any fMRI data, non-responders were labeled as non-responders accurately 61.8% of the time and responders were labeled correctly responders 63.8% of the time. So without using any fMRI data, people could determine if someone was going to react well to TMS based off their clinical symptoms about 63% of the time. However, when we use all the fMRI data that we can, we can predict if someone will react well to TMS at 93.6% accuracy. Thus, this really shows that it's so much more accurate to use fMRI data than just going off clinical data alone. So now that we know that depression can be broken up into different groups based off of functional connectivity, the researchers also wanted to know if other disorders such as generalized anxiety disorder share biotypes with depression. So the researchers took a group of 39 people with generalized anxiety disorder who did not also qualify to be diagnosed as depression. So they measured the functional connectivity of these 39 people and they tested to see if any of these people fit into any of the four biotypes. They found that 69.2% of the people who were diagnosed with anxiety fit into one of the four biotypes of depression. 59.3 of the 69.2% were all a part of the same biotype, which was biotype four. This graph shows the distribution of the different groups that the people with anxiety were put into. 30% of the people with anxiety did not fit into any biotype of depression. 20.5% fit into biotype one, 0% fit into biotype two, 7.7% .7 fit into biotype three, and 41 percent fit into biotype 4. So it's really interesting to think about. So if you think about it, someone in biotype 4 who is depressed might have a more son similar connectivity to someone who is also in biotype 4 but not diagnosed with depression but rather generalized anxiety. And they are more similar to these person with anxiety than someone who is also depressed in biotype 1. So it just really shows how silly it is that we base treatment so much off of clinical symptoms when really our brains are not just all about the clinical. There's more going on than just the symptoms we report. So we really need to start looking more inside of the brain rather than just talking about the symptoms and treating based off of the symptoms. So I just wanted to share this research to show that there is really promising work being done that is going to 
have the treatment of depression being treated in a much more logical and science-based way than it has been treated in the past and I just want to share it with the world and so that people more and more people can understand what is going on and can really fight for a smarter system of treating depression. In my next video I'm going to be talking about pharmacogenetics which is another really smart way to look at medication. So in pharmacogenetics, they can look at someone's genetics to understand how likely someone is to be able to break down a certain drug or to be able to respond to a drug. And just like this study, it is a really promising route to go down to have a better way of medicating people with depression. And if you are interested in learning more about the depression of neuroscience, I have three other videos on the neuroscience of depression, which I will link in the description below. One being on the stress model of depression, one being on uh, cell growth in the hippocampus, and the third being on how different forms of serotonin affect cell growth in the hippocampus. And cell growth in the hippocampus is really important because the main thing that sets people with depression apart from other people is their decrease in size of the hippocampus. So that's why I spent so much time talking about that. I also have other videos on how mindfulness meditation affects the brain, as well as how forgiveness and visualization happen in the brain. So definitely I'll check, check all those things out in the playlist below called Empowered by Neuroscience, where I really have all the videos I've made about neuroscience there. If you like this video, please like it. And if you wanna see more videos on how you can be empowered by neuroscience, subscribe to my channel, share this with anyone who you think it would help. All right, bye.